Thank you. And it's such a pleasure to be here tonight. You know, this is a real New Mexico Zendo. For the people who aren't here, I don't know where you are, but this is a mud floor, which is traditional in New Mexico. And you very rarely run into it anymore. Can I, I'm gonna adjust this a little. You very rarely run into it anymore. And it's made, usually the tradition is sheep's blood makes that dark color. So I don't know if they used it for the Zendo. And then this gorgeous wall, it's not pasted over anything. This is all the straw and you could see the sand. So when people are sitting Zazen and facing the wall, they get to face New Mexico. So it, it's very wonderful. It's a great old Zendo. So I'm happy to be here. And on January 8th, I'm not usually this precise, January 8th, I gave a Dharma talk at Upaya Zen Center, which is across the valley. Santa Fe is very lucky to have two beautiful Zendos. And um, they were studying koans. But I started the talk and I said, I've always been a teacher or a student. And I could feel people were shocked by it. So I thought that um, I would talk about this tonight. And what's so interesting, I madly took notes after my other talk. I looked at the notes and none of them held water because you change a whole, it's almost a month, not quite, but life changes so quickly and the mind changes. But I do want to talk about that. I've been either a teacher or a student my whole life. I'm very proud of that. I'm proud of being a teacher. Um, definitely in Zen, and I never hear it talked about, that that, and especially in Asia, being a teacher is considered the highest um, thing that you can do because you're passing on, you're sharing, you're sharing what you know. And it doesn't even mean Dharma. It means woodworking or running or how to make ice cream. It's a very generous act to pass on and to help. And I have a teaching certificate, which is really in the, yes, in the public schools. And I'm very proud of that. And I have to admit, when, after Bones came out and I left the public schools, probably for 30 years, I mourned not being in the public schools because you get these kids in their desks for a whole year, every day, five days a week. You can do a lot with them. And also, I got to meet people I would never meet in my normal life. But in the public schools, I got to meet them. And I'm wondering how many of you remember your teachers? I want to see your hands up, class. Good. Can you name all your teachers? <laughs> Kindergarten was Miss Shepherd. First grade was Miss Howard. Second grade was Miss McKee. Third grade was Miss Schneider. She was very mean. She had red lipstick. And um, fourth grade was Mrs. Post. Don't mess with Mrs. Post. And then fifth grade was Mr. Burke, who was really into science. I loved science because Mr. Burke loved science. And then in sixth grade, Mr. Nolan, who always fell over my suitcase, my school bag, which I put on the side of my desk. And I have great pleasure and memories from school, partially because my home life was miserable and it was such a relief. Now, none of this was conscious, but I just loved going to school because I got to go get away and there was some sanity. There was some order. 
And I thought about this a lot as I continued in my life. And then I met in ninth grade, Mr. Clementi, and he loved literature. So I loved literature. And if, and it's fine if you didn't, but in Long Quiet Highway, I write about all my teachers. And uh, Mr. Clementi is the one who one day walked in, this was in ninth grade, and it was pouring out a New York rain, really pouring out. And he turned off the light in the classroom. So it got dark. No one ever dared do that. And at the time, we still had big windows. And he said, just listen to the rain. You're not going to be tested. Nothing. Just listen to the rain. And you could put your head on your desk. Wow. It was fantastic. I never forgot that. It broke the structure of public school. But Mr. Clementi was a wonderful, dedicated teacher. And then I had another wonderful English teacher, Mr. Cates. Do you know that to this day, when I, oh, I just almost felt teary. To this day, when I finish a book, the manuscript, and I handwrite them, I think, okay, is this good enough for Mr. Cates? That's how strong he was and um, as a teacher. And in the summers, I found out he spent all summer, he would pick one writer and read everything by them during that summer and then come back to school. And I don't know, you know, it's too bad that now there's such a bad um, reputation about teachers and about public school teachers, so much hate and violence toward them. It's terrible. It's a wonderful thing to have a teacher, and it's a wonderful thing to be a teacher. And um, I really honor my public school teachers. And I hope if you went to private school, I never even knew there was a, such a thing as a private school, that you had some good teachers, as good as my private public school teachers. So um, life went on, and I, uh, I had a restaurant called Naked Lunch, and it was um, the first uh, natural foods restaurant in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and I taught cooking classes at the Y. And I realized I love to teach. And I went back to get a teaching certificate. And I'm, I'll just throw this out. In the last six months, somebody called me. I, I didn't actually know who he was, but he was a legitimate Zen teacher. And he said, I want to give you Dharma transmission. And I said, oh, thank you, but I don't need it. I don't need permission to teach. I already have a teaching certificate. <laughs> and I said, it's the most proud thing I have. And thank you very much. And also, should I tell you this now? Okay, I will. So I went on and I taught in the public schools and I eventually met Katagiri Roshi, who was pretty much straight out of Japan. You see what happened in the um in the 60s and 70s, Japan was still coming back from World War II. And you have to understand, World War II was the first time they lost a battle. Japan had always been tremendous warrior people, and they created a lot of suffering with Korea, with China. Way before World War II, they started trouble. I could be very specific, but I'm not going to right now. But people were very curious about the United States because they, everybody in Japan had taken a vow that if they didn't win, they would all commit um, suicide. 
And so they were so when we took over, I mean, not to say that the bomb, dropping the bomb was that great, but when we took over, they were great fighters. My father always says, the Japanese, he said, I fought them and you're studying with them. And, but he said they were great fighters. And uh, people in Japan were very curious and were told we were monsters. And when they saw that, that we weren't, the Zen teachers were interested in coming over here. One of the reasons is nobody in Japan wanted to practice Zen very seriously because they were very interested in building their country again that had been completely destroyed. And the Japanese had great energy and they were busy building. And so some of the great Japanese teachers and some of the not so great Japanese teachers came to the United States in the 60s and 70s. Katagiri Roshi came to help Suzuki Roshi that many of you know, who was in San Francisco, who wrote Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. And Katagiri came to just help. And he came straight out of Aeji Monastery. Very tough, very mean. <laughs> Not mean, but tough, very tough. So this, this is a wonderful story. When Katagiri and Suzuki were working together, they flew from San Francisco to New York on a plane. At, maybe you all know this story, but um, Suzuki said to Katagiri, come here. And they both looked out the window and Suzuki said to Katagiri when they were flying over the Midwest, this is where the real Americans are. And, you know, because when you come from another country, you don't know a lot. So Katagiri wanted to be with the real Americans. He was very straight laced and um, he was horrified by all the hippies at San Francisco Zen Center. So when he was asked to um, come to Minneapolis, he immediately said, yes, I would love to. I am sometimes haunted by the fact that he said yes, because at the time in the early 70s, Minnesota, especially Minneapolis, um, was a lot of white people. And there was no Japanese food at all. There was one Italian restaurant and they served meatballs and spaghetti. So um, I sometimes felt badly that Katagiri ended up in Minneapolis, which was very different than when George Floyd was murdered. And we found out that the police were keeping black people in their own corner. But at the time, we didn't know that. And so I always felt badly. It was freezing there. It went December 2nd. It went down to 20 below. And it didn't change. It didn't come up on that first year I was there until April. So I always felt bad about it. But just recently, I read Katagiri adored Dogen. He would never use the word adore. But he did. He studied deeply Dogen and talked about Dogen a lot. And um, Adigiri, I always felt badly that he ended up there. But I read recently that Dogen first was at Fukukusu Temple, but then he heard that Japan was, do you all know who Dogen is? He was a, a Zen teacher from the 12th century and did a lot of writing, pretty smart man. So he moved from Fukukusu because the government was against Buddhism. So he moved up where Aeji was. It wasn't called Aeji then, but it was very cold, but he was much safer because people didn't want to go to that area of Japan. So he was safer. So probably Katagiri heard that Minneapolis was very cold, and he thought, great, I'll go there like Dogen did. 
So I moved to um, Minneapolis when I was 30 years old. I went there to get married and I was into Buddhism. I was studying with Choigam Trumpa Rinpoche, but any Zen or any Buddhist teacher there, I would go to. And so I started practicing with Katagiri Roshi. Lucky me. And what I want to say is, one of the things that I want to say that's important is, I had a teacher. I had a Zen teacher, and he was practicing. And whether I was there or not, he was there. And I want to um, tell you some of the things about him. He practiced every day. He was there at 5 a.m., whether we were there or not, every day. And he used to say, I'm not here for Minnesota Zen Center. I'm here for all sentient beings, every moment, forever. And he meant it. He wasn't fucking around. I knew him for 12 years. He showed up. And um, so this is how I learned from a teacher, not my public school teachers, but from a Zen teacher. Um, you know, it was unbelievable to come at 5 a.m. Are you out of your mind? I was 30 years old. It was a whole new way of seeing things. And every day he would be there. And I would try and, you know, I'd, I'd put the alarm for four o'clock and I'd look out and it was freezing out. And I'd think, no, I'm not going. And then maybe I'd manage to get every 10 days, one day I'd get there. And I'd walk into the Zendo and there he was, you know, sitting already. And I, of course, would walk in and expect bells. Very good, Natalie. Excellent. Excellent. Nothing. Never, and But also was never um, put down for not showing up. It didn't matter. It was at zero. You came or you didn't come. It didn't matter. And it took three years for me to wake something up inside me that I started just coming regularly for no reason. Whether he was there or not, I would be there. And I wasn't holding anything up, but it took three years for that to wake up in me. Does that make sense? That's how you learned. That's how I learned from a teacher. Um, I didn't, it was, I watched him. It was non-intellectual. And what Zen really does, and this is really important, and I'm really understanding it more and more. And I understood, I tried to understand it when I wrote, wrote Long Quiet Highway in 1992. What is a teacher? I don't mean just a Zen teacher. I mean a public school teacher. They're giving you a structure. For instance, Mrs. Post gave me four times four is 16. My parents would never give me that. They were busy shopping and getting food and doing other things. But the, a teacher gives you a structure, teaches you something. Now, of course, parents teach you, teach you not to throw food or uh, use a fork, but it's different. And from Katagiri, I really learned about structure. And not just structure about showing up. I, one of the things I wanted to say is this is my, the first time in my life when I'm not a student and I'm not a teacher. And all this stuff is coming into me that I was busy teaching. So I wasn't receiving all those years I studied with Katagiri. So this morning I was thinking about someone. And of course, I was lost in all kinds of feelings. And then uh, the structure of which I learned 
from Zen that the poisons of ego and what they're drawing toward you, pushing away or numbness, desire, wanting, pushing away or numbness, falling asleep. No one talked about that. You think my parents would talk about that? And at some point I sat there and I felt thinking about this person who I'm, I was having a hard time with inside me. I remembered that structure and I remembered, oh, he's suffering. He's full of desire. And I was able to let go. Does this make sense? And what I am beginning to understand, I don't know if anyone else has said this, is that, and I've done a lot of therapy because after I left Katagiri, who Japan does not did not believe in therapy, it was a very modern thing, and we uh, Katagiri poo pooed therapy. So I had I left him. Well, I didn't leave him. He died in 1990. Very sad. He died of cancer at 62 years old. That was very young. I didn't understand it then. But he, um, where was I going? Th oh, therapy. Thank you. He didn't believe in it. But after I left, after it was done, I knew that I was very clear over here and very messed up over here because I still hadn't done anything about my family of origin. And Zen doesn't necessarily, Zen gives you structure, which can really free you. But I needed to understand my family. Katagiri, in the 12 years I worked with him, I don't think he even knew that I had a sister, that I, my father owned a bar, he did, or that my parents were alive. We never talked about that, but I brought my suffering to him and his response from his response, which felt like from left field, really taught me about Zen. But it didn't go into the my parents. It didn't go into the craziness in my life. I hope this makes sense. But it really freed me. And I understand it more even now. Now that I've done a lot of therapy, I understand therapy's place and Zen's place and how that structure liberated me. I remember Roshi talking about anger. Now, you know, we talk about anger in therapy. I'm angry at my parents. I'm angry. Blah, 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 blah. He would say anger. Now, you have to understand, in sitting Zazen, he, he got the opportunity in the monasteries to really study these things. Not where it came from but the actual activity of anger. And I remember him saying, anger is very quick energy. If you don't stop it, it goes right through you and is done. Now, most of us were like, anger? We grab it and fight with it. And he would say, that's like fighting tofu. It gets you nowhere. Do you see? So it was very structured and also the act of slowing down and sitting zazen and just being with your breath. If you're lucky, instead of being angry the whole time at so-and-so, you can instead feel the nature of anger. Now, of course, when we did it, it was very, very tough. He was giving us straight Japanese Zen. We sat 40 minutes, three in a row. And um, it was just very tough. And um, I, what I learned about was the nature of monkey mind because it was so painful 
and we never moved. You never moved. And luckily I was young and could sit cross-legged. Oh, my knees hurt. Everything hurt. But in order to bear it, I would make up stories or fantasies. So I learned about monkey mind really well from that. Does that make sense? I learned, I thought about sex, anything not to be here because it hurt too much to be here. And I remember one day thinking during Sashin, well, Natalie, why don't you just try to be present for a minute? Katagiri talks about it. Let's try. So I, I thought, okay, and just be with your breath. Oh, and you have to understand, he didn't do all, he didn't speak English well, and he didn't have a lot of explanation. It was just sit. That was it. And you just sat a lot. So I thought, okay, he didn't even say be present, be in the moment. I thought, okay, just be with your breath. I breathed in, I breathed out. Oh my God, this is way too scary. I shot right off again on some other thought. But doing that, I learned about the mind and I learned about monkey mind and I learned how we create things and I learned about how to write. <laughs> In some way, I when I started teaching writing practice, I deeply understood about self-criticism, about all the things that keep us from doing whatever we want to do. So actually, it wasn't a waste of time. And actually, all that sitting now is coming home to me. Now that I'm not the teacher or the student, I'm just a person. It's all coming home to me. Do you hear that, Katagiri? I brought his um, rakasu. You don't wear rakasus here. And I know I could have put it on, but I just felt like he wanted to be with us. So I brought his rakasu here. So he would know that um, it wasn't all for naught because sometimes... I think he thought it was, and he made such effort, and he had to try to speak English. At the same time, that practice helped him to see very, very clearly. He didn't, you know, I would walk in and see him, and we'd have a one-to-one, -one, and I thought, how do you know me? But he didn't, um, he was just there. And what was so sad for me, we don't realize these teachers just show up. Katagiri was there. I realized I thought of him like my parents. They're just there. He would never die. And when I moved back to New Mexico, I went up to him and I said, well, going back to New Mexico. And he said, the gate swings both ways. I said, you're not going to miss me? He said, the gate swings both ways. He said, you'll be okay because you're building that beer can and tire house all alone up on a mesa. He said, you'll be okay. And I was a little bit insulted. I said, well, I will miss you. And I walked out. <laughs> but I, I didn't know. I didn't know how deep it was. Actually, till I wrote writing down the bones in that writing, writing down the bones, I saw the structure. I thought, oh, my God, that's it. I get it now. So um, maybe I'll give you an example, OK, of he and I meeting. Um, I told this the other day to my really good friend, Wendy Johnson, maybe some of you know her. She's a, um, she was a gardener for a long time at Green Gulch. And I told her the story and I saw it totally differently than I did before.
but I think it might be a good example. So it was Sishin, and I was um, always, I guess, rebelling, but I didn't know any better. None of us knew any better. We were all savages. I remember we were just all savages. And Katagiri was trying to teach us the structure of the mind and how human beings could live. But we we didn't know what he was talking about most of the time, but we kept, I certainly kept showing up, but many of us did because it was the best thing going. He was so alive. So um, this was, we call it old Zen. It was direct from Japan. Now you're lucky enough to have teachers who have digested the U.S. and what the culture is here. And, oh, and maybe some of you I know are in Europe. I'm sure you, the cultures have mixed now, but we were getting it straight into the blood from Japan, right from the monastery. So we're in Sishin, which was unbearable. We would sit from 5 a.m. till 10 at night. We had one half hour tea break at three in the afternoon. I remember this, where we would have tea and maybe a cookie <laughs> if we were very lucky. And um we and there was no money. It was Minneapolis. We didn't have any money or anything. And, you know, I remember the hard boiled eggs. People were concerned we would have protein. So it was Oriochi. I'm not going to go into all this, but it was cold, hard boiled eggs, not even warm. So um, um, we were sitting Sashin and it was the middle of the Sashin. And I guess at some point I decided I was hungry and went into the kitchen and stuck my finger in the peanut butter jar put my finger in my mouth, ate some peanut butter, and then stuck it in again and ate it. I'd never been brought up that you're not supposed to do that. <laughs> my parents were barbarians too, I guess. So, you know, then I screwed back the jar and put it back on the shelf. This was during a little break. And I went back and Tony Artino stopped me in the hallway and said, you're not supposed to do that. I said, do what? And he said, put your finger in the peanut butter. I said, this is Sashin, and we're supposed to be on silence. You're not supposed to talk to me. And he, and I walked away, and Katagiri, the house was, we had a house, and he and his family were upstairs. They had their apartment upstairs. And it was a stairwell and we would climb up the stairs and go up. So I was, I mean, I was just outraged that he would talk to me during Sashin. So I went right up the stairs. Had to gear out, uh, Roshi, Roshi, can I talk to you a minute? And he was probably preparing his talk because he gave a talk every day and he, he, worked so hard on these talks. We never understood them, or I should speak to, for myself. I never understood them. And also he was speaking in very broken English, but he worked so hard and so sincere. Roshi, may I come in and see you for a minute? Come in. He knew it was me, of course, my heavy New York accent, though he didn't know what a New York accent was. I walked in and I said, <laughs> I said, Roshi, Tony Artino talked to me in the hallway when we're supposed to be on silence. He attacked me for eating peanut butter. Now, Roshi just said, now this is really important. He said, you're a troublemaker. I said, no, Tony Artino. Oh, talk to me. Natalie, you're a troublemaker. Stop creating trouble. Whoop. You're a troublemaker. Stop creating trouble. Uh, and I left. <laughs> but understand, 
There was no residue. I didn't feel badly. I didn't feel, you know, I went back. I thought, hmm, I think I didn't even think about it till years later when Wendy said to me, you are a troublemaker, Natalie. I thought, I said to Wendy, how did he know I was a troublemaker? She said, you were causing trouble right there, telling on Tony Artino. I said, oh, I thought it was some deep Zen thing, but really it was. He was present. But you have to understand, there was no residue. Okay, he didn't, well, how, who was, how many fingerfuls did you take? Or it was, don't, he didn't get involved. And I never felt afterwards they saw me and thought, oh, there she is, the troublemaker. I never felt any of that. It was clean. That was the great teaching. And I never felt guilty. Or I never felt badly. And I didn't go and fight with Tony Artino anymore during that session. And it could have been terrible. You could get all whipped up, you know, and sit. But it, it, it wasn't like that. I hope this makes some sense. Oh, I'm not. Okay, I'm okay. I'm in time. So that's an example. It's a structure. And I think this is really important. And I'm going to think about it a lot more that our parents and our family create therapy, create us go. I never went to therapy about Katagiri because he didn't cause me any trouble. But boy, was I mixed up and as my parents were mixed up and handed it on. So I needed therapy to work with that, but I would never go to Katagiri about that. And if I did, I never went about my parents, but I did go, I did get divorced and I brought my suffering, but he met me at the level of suffering, not good or bad. Or not arguing. Well, did you tell him this? Did you say this? Did it? I remember once before we broke up, he was a musician and I said, you know, he's, he's gone so much. And I thought, and this, this was another example. He said, oh, he said, I'll call him and talk to him. I said, what? Don't, don't call him. He said, well, he'll talk to me, won't he? When will he be home? I said, well, he'll be home Monday night. He said, I'll call him. And I, I left and I thought, oh, my God, I didn't expect that. And not only that, oh, he'll forget. Sure enough, Monday night, ding-a-ling-a-ling, ding-a-ling-a-ling, the phone rang. Brett picked it up. Oh, hi, Roshi. And I think he said to him, could you be home a little bit more? And Brett went, sure. And hung up. Okay. So do you see it was never what I expected? And in that, I learned about Zen. Also from sitting so much, because that was our, really our practice was sitting. There was nothing else. There weren't koans. There was nothing but the structure of the mind. He never said the structure of the mind. And I know I wrote this down because I wanted to, um, pre it presents different configurations of the human mind. Koans do that, different koans, but we didn't even have that. We just sat. So I had a teacher that was really my teacher. He died 33 years ago, and I studied with many other teachers. As soon as he died, I couldn't handle it. I went to Plum Village, and I studied with Thich Nhat Hanh for eight years, I say with a lot of teachers, but Katagiri was my teacher. You know, you meet someone and it's right. Now, what's wonderful, I think, about Mountain Cloud 
it's not one teacher. I think you meet in committees and you do things as a group. That was too sophisticated for what we were doing in Minnesota. You have to understand, Katagiri didn't know how to protect himself or he didn't really understand the mind of this culture. It was very different. He only looked for what he knew in Japan. And I appreciate that. I got a lot from it. That won't happen anymore. First of all, I'll never be that young and stupid and reveal myself so much. And second of all, you don't have Japanese teachers coming over now. You have people who've practiced really hard and know this culture. So it's pretty wonderful. I wish I was young again and could do it over again. But I got what I got. So maybe I'll just open it up for a few minutes um, if you have any questions. I hope this was helpful. It's very strong for me right now not to be a teacher or a student. I'm getting really, I don't know if smart, but... <laughs> I'm really in there in a way I'm not even trying. It was always there. I just didn't notice it. I was too busy. Is there any question? And can we make it loud enough that so they'll hear it? Over there in that thing? Yeah. Okay. It's a big group in here. Okay. Go ahead. Hi. What's your name? Alfie. Alfie? Alfie. Okay. Thank you very much, Alfie. Um, can you hear me? I'm not yes, I can hear you. Um, if it's possible to answer, I was just curious um, when you went to Thunder with Chitan and a very different teacher. I wondered uh, how you might compare the, the two teachers, the um, two teachings. Thank you. Well, you know, with Katagiri, it was kick ass. You know, you just showed up and it was physical. And, you know, I mean, I could tell story after story, but when I went to Plum Village, I was heartbroken. And I was totally blown out. We sat for half an hour in the morning and a half an hour in the evening. And the rest of the time, we just hung out. There wasn't even, we weren't even sewing or doing anything. We just hung out. And it was very weird for me and kind of terrific. Kind of terrific. I thought, oh my God, Katagiri wouldn't believe this. But then I got to meet with um, Thich Nhat Hanh and in a small group. And I said to him, you know, my heart's broken. I don't know how to handle that Katagiri died. I want to go get him. <laughs> I want to go get him. And um, Ty, who was very beautiful and, you know, graceful, he said, oh, I knew Katagiri we were good friends. I visited him in Minnesota Zen Center. He was always going to come to visit Plum Village, but he never got to. But he's here now. You can find him in the birds, in the trees. He's here now. That was a beautiful teaching but I wasn't ready for it. I think I came back with, no, <laughs> I want, you know, I was very stubborn, but I took it in and he understood my heart was broken. And as uh, someone, there was talk about me getting Dharmacharya there and someone said, He'll, she'll never be yours. She'll always be Katagiri's. But, 
you know, she deserves it, but I didn't do it. Yeah, it didn't happen. But, you know, you have one teacher, as they say in Judaism, don't be a haza. That's in um, Yiddish, meaning pig. I can't be a pig. I can study with people, but I can't, you know, I had a teacher and I was very lucky. A lot of people have no teachers. Any other question? Thank you. I mean, nervous now I forgot my question. <laughs> um, What's your name? Oh, sorry. My name is Stacy. Stacy. Okay. Yes. Um, I'm curious that uh, if you're not a teacher and you're not a student, well, what are you now? What are you? I'm just a human being like other people. I mean, do you see yourself as a writer? Oh, oh, uh, you know, I don't, I guess I'm a writer. You know, I don't, that isn't my identity. Uh -huh. I write and I, you know, I write books, but right now I'm, I finished a book and I know the next book I'm going to write, but I don't see myself as a writer right now. I just am enjoying so much being a human being yeah. who maybe writes, <laughs> who will write. But I don't, it's never been a big identity. I, I taught for um, 12 years in the public schools. Uh -huh. And I have to say, I agree with you. It's like, to me, it was like, uh, I went to it as a, uh, because I was in grief. So you were in it, what? I was grieving. Ah, uh, okay. So I thought, I got to do something where I have to get up in the morning. And I have to say, it was like falling in love oh, all the time. That makes me so happy. So I agree with you. It's a great, great thing. And I wish people realized that. Yeah. Thank you. Makes me happy. Do we have time for one more or should we help me? I think there's one more. Is there one more person? Oh, okay. Over there. Yeah, we'll do one more. Thank you so much. I'm curious to hear more about your writing practice. I think you said something in your talk of how the structure of Zen in your writing practice, it was, I don't know the words you said, it was just there or that structure. There was something really like the way they overlapped was there was a lot of, um, yeah, just like helpful overlap. And I'm just curious yeah. to hear more about that. Read writing down the bones. It'll okay. tell you. Okay. Yeah. I talked enough about writing practice for the rest of my life, I think. <laughs> I, I want to say one thing, though, that I forgot to tell you at the beginning, and I wanted to. Did you see that Henry Shookman has a poem in the New New Yorker? Yeah, a wonderful poem about his Jewish father. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. I hope I helped. The four vows of the Bodhisattva. Sentient beings are numberless. I vow to free them. Delusions are inexhaustible. I vow to end them. The Dharma gates are boundless. I vow to enter them. The enlightened way is unsurpassable. I vow to embody it. Sentient beings are numberless. I vow to free them. Delusions are inexhaustible. I vow to end them. 
The Dharma gates are boundless. I vow to enter them. The enlightened way is unsurpassable. I vow to embody it. Sentient beings are numberless. I vow to free them. Delusions are inexhaustible. I vow to end them. The Dharma gates are boundless. I vow to enter them. The enlightened way is unsurpassable. I vow to embody it.